two girls went to the park on their bikes and disappeared. This marked the beginning of events that were incredibly hard to believe. From the very beginning, this story resembled a detective thriller with an unbelievable plot. As things unfolded, it became even more puzzling until all the mysteries converged into one solution. Laura Hobbs was born on September 25, 1996, in Texas. Later, her parents had three sons, but soon after, the couple separated. Laura's mom moved with the children to the small town of Zion in Illinois. Laura loved this place. Her maternal grandparents lived there, and she quickly made new friends. Moreover, Zion was located on the shore of Lake Michigan, and she enjoyed going there with her relatives. In the spring of 2005, when Laura was eight years old, her father decided to reconcile with his wife and move back into the children's lives. He relocated from Texas to live with the family. On Sunday, May 8th, it was Mother's Day. Laura, along with her brothers and parents, went to the lake to celebrate the occasion and fly kites. They had a great time, and later Laura wanted to go for a walk with her best friend, nine-year-old Crystal. The girls attended the same school and lived close to each other. When Laura moved to Zion, they immediately became friends and spent almost all their free time together. They visited each other's homes, played near their houses, and rode bikes. Sometimes, when Laura's mom didn't allow her to go out, Crystal would come to her window and they would talk. On that day, they decided to take their bikes and go to the park, which was only a few hundred yards from their homes. They often went there since the park was very close and it had a long bike trail. Despite their age, parents weren't afraid to let their daughters go there because both girls knew the area well and serious crimes in the town were extremely rare. The girls left around 3 p.m. and were supposed to be back for dinner. However, as time passed, their parents started worrying. When it was 7 p.m. and Laura and Crystal still hadn't returned, they decided to go to the park and call them home. To the surprise of the adults, the girls were not there. They walked along the bike path calling their names, but there was only silence in return. Other relatives and friends of the families quickly joined the search. They continued to search the park and also went through the streets of their neighborhood, hoping to find them. This went on for several hours until it started to get dark. By 9 p.m., the parents realized that something might have happened to their daughters, and they decided to contact the police. The police immediately joined the search efforts. They contacted volunteer organizations and enlisted the help of several dozen volunteers, as well as search dogs. In addition to this, local residents who heard about the girls' disappearance also joined the search. The police focused their efforts on the park area since the girls were supposed to go there. Speaking to other children living along the route from their homes to the park, the police learned that Laura and Crystal did indeed pass by them, stopped to chat, and mentioned that they were heading to the park. Parallel to the search, the police went door to door in the neighborhood in hopes of finding anyone who had seen the girls that evening. They also began distributing flyers with information about their disappearance. As each hour passed, it became increasingly evident that something terrible had happened to the girls. Darkness had already fallen, and they were being searched for throughout the town, but there were simply no traces of Laura and Crystal. The search continued practically until dawn, and at around half past four, the police decided to take a break. However, Laura's father and her grandfather refused to return home and continued scouring the area. They went to the park and decided to split up to cover more ground. Around 6 a.m., as the first light of day began to break, Laura's grandfather suddenly heard a cry and rushed in that direction. He stumbled upon Laura's father, who was in shock and claimed to have found the bodies of Laura and Crystal. They lay off the bike path amidst thick undergrowth. Laura's father immediately realized that both girls were dead, as there was a lot of blood and injuries on them. The man called the police, and they arrived promptly. After examining the bodies, forensic experts determined that the cause of the girls' deaths was multiple stab wounds, most likely from a knife. Laura had 20 such injuries on her body, while Crystal had 11. This news sent shockwaves through the small town. Such crimes were almost unheard of there, but now they were faced with the horrifying reality that an unknown assailant had killed two young girls just a few hundred meters from their homes. The police focused all their efforts on finding the culprit. Their initial suspicion fell on Laura's father, Jerry. They were concerned by the fact that he had managed to find the bodies alone after the park had already been searched by officers and volunteers. Digging deeper, they discovered that Jerry had a significant criminal history, 
ranging from drug-related offenses in his youth to assaults on people. One incident in 2001 had led to his wife and children moving to another state. On that day, while they still lived in Texas, Jerry and his wife had a heated argument that quickly escalated. They were in front of their home, and three men passing by noticed the situation and intervened, thinking the woman was in danger. Jerry became infuriated and went to get his chainsaw, then started chasing those men. Eventually, they managed to subdue him and hold him down until the police arrived. Jerry faced charges, and a year later, he was sentenced to 10 years of probation. As part of his probation, he was required to regularly check in with his probation officer, but he missed one of those appointments. Consequently, his probation was revoked, and he was sentenced to 18 months in prison. He was released from prison just a few weeks before the tragic deaths of his daughter and her friend, and he had come to Zion almost immediately after his release. For the police, it was clear that Jerry had a propensity for aggressive behavior. However, they had no evidence or motive, so they invited him for questioning. He agreed to go to the police station, and investigators gradually began to press him about his involvement. Over the course of more than 20 hours of questioning, Jerry initially denied any involvement in his daughter and her friend's deaths. He insisted he had nothing to do with it, and claimed that he and his wife noticed Laura hadn't returned. So he went searching. He said he continued searching until he found the girls' bodies in the park. However, later on, Jerry suddenly started changing his story. In the end, under the relentless pressure from detectives, he began to confess. He said that on that evening, he did indeed went looking for his daughter and saw her in the park with Crystal. He scolded her for going out without permission and demanded that she come with him. However, she refused and he grabbed her arm attempting to take her home. She resisted, and her friend Crystal also demanded that he leave the girl alone. According to Jerry, Crystal took out a small knife from her pocket and pointed it at him. This infuriated Jerry. He seized the knife and inflicted multiple stab wounds on both girls, then left their bodies in the overgrown part of the park and walked away. Later, by morning, he allegedly found the girls and personally reported it to the police to divert suspicion from himself. During this confession, Jerry was in tears, but he still signed his admission statement and repeated it on camera. I was walking on a dirt trail and I ran into Laura and her friends, Crystal, on the trail. I told Laura that she had to come home and she argued with me and I grabbed her by the arm. She tried pulling away and was telling me to let her go. Crystal was also telling me to let Laura go. Crystal pulled out a small knife from her pocket and again, told me to let Laura go. Laura was fighting me and I punched her in the face and she dropped to the ground. The relatives of the girls were shocked by this turn of events. None of them could have imagined that Laura's own father would turn out to be the killer. However, his wife later told the police that she had always known about her husband's propensity for aggression, considering his previous criminal offenses. Nevertheless, the man admitted his guilt and was subsequently arrested awaiting trial in prison. Soon, the prosecutor announced his intention to seek the death penalty. The preparation for the trial dragged on, and during this time some intriguing developments occurred in the case. Jerry was appointed a lawyer, and he suddenly claimed that he had no involvement in these murders. According to him, he confessed under immense pressure from detectives who had interrogated him for over 20 hours. He also alleged that they had threatened him and his family and subjected him to physical abuse. At that point, he had not slept for over two days and was in an extremely distraught state because he had found his daughter murdered and couldn't cope with the grief. The police began to tell him that if he simply confessed to the murders, they would release him and allow him to get some rest. They essentially formulated the most likely scenario of what had happened for him, and Jerry merely echoed their words. When the detectives pieced together a coherent narrative, they wrote down this confession for him to sign, and asked him to read the text from the paper on camera. His attorney immediately requested a case review, but it was swiftly denied. The prosecution argued that Jerry had confessed voluntarily and affirmed his statement on camera. Nevertheless, after retracting his confession, he had to go through a full-fledged trial with a jury, which prolonged his wait for several years. Following this, Jerry's lawyer discovered some significant details. Initially, he knew that there wasn't a single real piece of evidence against his client and decided to focus on searching for any leads. Here, 
he found out that the medical examiners had not even thoroughly examined the bodies of the girls. They had conducted all the standard procedures, like taking swabs, collecting debris from under the girls' fingernails, and so on. However, after storing these samples in the refrigerator, no one had considered analyzing their contents. The lawyer pushed to have all these pieces of evidence examined in an independent laboratory. The prosecution tried to obstruct his efforts, but he succeeded in his task. In 2008, the examinations were finally conducted, and there was a rather unexpected twist. It turned out that Laura's body had several different DNA samples on it. There was foreign skin under her fingernails, and male semen found on her clothes and in three places on her body. Simple analysis revealed that none of this belonged to Laura's father. It all pointed to a completely different man. This discovery unequivocally indicated that Laura had been sexually assaulted. As for Crystal, they did not find any foreign DNA on her body, but no one doubted that she was killed by the same person. Jerry's lawyer immediately requested his client's release from prison and the dismissal of all charges. However, an unpleasant surprise awaited him here as well. The district prosecutor refused to acknowledge the new evidence, claiming that it meant nothing. In his opinion, the presence of foreign DNA on Laura's body could have been entirely coincidental. He argued that young couples regularly visited that park for intimate encounters, and he believed that this was why male semen ended up on the girl's body, possibly from the grass or bushes. Even the fact that some biological samples were found inside the victim's body didn't seem to faze him. Despite the absurdity of this version, Jerry remained in prison, awaiting the start of his trial. Nevertheless, the lawyer managed to get the DNA sample entered into the FBI's database, but there were no matches. All he could do was wait and hope that the perpetrator would be caught sooner or later because there was no hope for reasonableness from the prosecution's side in Jerry's case. Let's fast forward four years and miles away from Zion. A 20-year-old woman named Amanda Snell, who had recently joined the military, lived in the military base in Arlington, Virginia. She decided to enlist because there were many military members in her family. Alongside her service, she occasionally helped a local church near the base. There, she taught children with autism and other developmental differences. Amanda quickly realized that she wanted to pursue this professionally and planned to get the necessary education after her military service. On July 13th, 2009, she didn't report for duty, immediately raising concerns among her fellow service members. They went to her room, knocked on the door, but received no response. They discovered that the door was unlocked and entered. The room was impeccably tidy, the bed was made, and her belongings were neatly in place, but Amanda was nowhere to be found. Only after they opened the closet did they come across a horrifying sight. Amanda's lifeless body lay in an unnatural position with a pillowcase over her head. Initially, the medical examiners couldn't determine the cause of death, but they later concluded that Amanda died of suffocation. Her death had occurred over a day before her body was discovered. There were no signs of trauma on her body, and she had not been sexually assaulted. Investigators only found out that her laptop and tablet were missing from her room. When speaking with Amanda's parents, investigators learned an interesting fact. She suffered from severe headaches, and sometimes, when the pain became unbearable, she would retreat to a dark room and put a pillowcase over her head. Considering that Amanda was found in her own closet with a pillowcase over her head, detectives speculated that what happened might have been a dreadful accident. Nonetheless, they didn't rush to dismiss the murder theory. In front of her closet, they found a trace of a men's shoe, but they couldn't establish its ownership. Consequently, the investigation remained open, and investigators continued searching for a potential killer. In February 2010, a 26-year-old woman from Arlington exited the metro station and headed towards her boyfriend's home. In the middle of the street, an unknown man approached her, showed a gun, and demanded she get into his car. Despite the assailant grabbing her arm and brandishing a knife, the woman managed to break free. She threw her purse as a distraction and fled toward her boyfriend's house. Upon hearing her cries, he and his friends rushed onto the street and called the police. By the time they did, the assailant had already fled. Nevertheless, the woman could provide a detailed description of his appearance. She also remembered the model of his car, a beige Dodge Durango. Based on the victim's description, a composite sketch of the suspect was created and the police began their search. Two weeks later, 
On February 27th, two women from Arlington were returning home after spending the evening with friends. When they stood at their doorstep, an unknown man approached from behind, brandishing a gun, and demanded their wallets. After the women informed him they had no money, the assailant forced them inside the house and bound their hands. At one point he left the room, and one of the women managed to free her hands. She grabbed a phone and dialed 911. However, the man swiftly returned, snatched the phone, and smashed it against the wall. Subsequently he grabbed one of the women, took her out to his car, and drove away. After covering some distance, he raped her, taped her head with duct tape, and strangled her with a scarf until she lost consciousness. She later regained consciousness in the snow by the side of the road when passers-by found her. She was taken to the hospital, where the police promptly arrived. The woman provided them with a description of the attacker and mentioned the model of his car, a beige Dodge Durango. Remarkably, just two hours before this attack, another woman had reported to the police. She told them that a man matching the same description and driving the same type of car had approached her on the street. He had attempted to coerce her into his vehicle, but she had used her stun gun on him and managed to escape. Investigators realized that they were dealing with a serial and highly dangerous criminal right in their midst. They focused their efforts on the vehicle, as it was easier to trace through databases. The police visited all owners of such cars, and soon they got lucky. During the inspection of one of these vehicles, they discovered a student ID belonging to the same woman who had been left to die in the snow, along with her earring. Inside the car, they also found the same type of tape used to bind her head and a stun gun. The owner of the car turned out to be a 21-year-old named Jorge Avila Torres, who was serving in the military at the very base where Amanda Snell's body had been found several months earlier. Moreover, he lived in the same building as her, just a few floors below. During the search of his room, investigators found a pistol he had purchased less than a month ago, along with numerous rounds of ammunition. On his computer, they discovered a significant amount of explicit videos depicting violence and cruelty. Some of these videos featured women who were unconscious. Photos of Torres, along with pictures of other men, were shown to all three women who had been attacked. They all unanimously identified him. They remembered his face well because during the assaults, he didn't even attempt to conceal it. Following this, Torres was arrested and placed in custody pending trial. Investigators suspected him of kidnapping one woman and assaulting two others, which seemed likely given the evidence. However, they faced another problem when they began to suspect Torres of Amanda's murder. There wasn't a single piece of evidence linking him to the crime, so detectives devised a clever plan. They planted an informant in his cell, someone willing to wear a wire and engage him in conversation. Surprisingly, this tactic worked remarkably fast. Within a week, Torres started confessing to his crimes. He openly boasted about killing Amanda, stating he did it just because the opportunity presented itself. He added that he did it for the adrenaline and provided a detailed account of how he placed her body in the closet. Torres also mentioned that after the murder, he had to meticulously clean her room to erase any traces. However, unknowingly, he left behind a piece of evidence during the cleanup. The criminal revealed to his cellmate that he had sexually assaulted the victim on her bed, using contraception. After moving her to the closet, Torres made her bed but removed the top sheet. However, he left the mattress pad, which the police immediately sent to the laboratory. Their experts found a tiny sample of male semen that matched Torres's DNA perfectly. Furthermore, Torres let slip to his informant that he had a pair of Nike sneakers that he kept in his car. Crime scene analysts seized the shoes and compared the sole pattern to the footprint found outside Amanda's closet. The sole pattern was an exact match. As a result, Torres was formally charged with murder, and he remained in custody awaiting trial. Meanwhile, a sample of his DNA had been uploaded to the FBI's database, and now we return to Zion. Several weeks after the sample was added to the database, Local investigators got a perfect match between Torres's DNA and the semen samples found on Laura Hobbs' body. What followed was even more astonishing. It turned out that Torres was originally from Zion and was friends with the older brother of the second murdered girl, Crystal. This connection confirmed that both Laura and Crystal knew Torres, a fact corroborated by other kids in the area. At the time of the girl's deaths, Torres was just 16 and the police hadn't considered him a suspect at all. They were solely focused on Laura's father, who had spent five years in jail awaiting trial. 
Once the DNA match was found, Jerry's attorney demanded his client's immediate release and the dropping of all charges. This time the prosecutor couldn't argue against it, as the discovery of Torres's semen on Laura's body eliminated the possibility of her father's involvement. After his release, Jerry announced his intention to sue the police and authorities for coercing a false confession from him and making him spend five years of imprisonment. They quickly realized they had no chance of winning this case, and in the event of a loss, they'd be held accountable for their misconduct and incompetence. So, they offered him a settlement, which he accepted, receiving nearly $8 million. As for Torres, the legal process in Virginia concluded four years after his arrest. He refused to admit guilt, but the jury unanimously found him guilty. He was sentenced to death for Amanda's murder, and for the attempted abduction of two other women and the kidnapping of a third, he received five life sentences, plus 168 years in prison. Immediately after this, he was extradited to Illinois, where the trial for the murders of Laura and Crystal began. Initially, he denied his guilt, and his lawyer tried to argue that the semen found on the victim wasn't enough to prove his client's guilt. However, Torres was eventually presented with a deal. He was already facing the death penalty, and even if that were delayed for decades, as it often happens, he would never walk free. So, the criminal agreed to confess to the murders in exchange for an additional 100 years in prison and a transfer to a different facility, as he felt his life was in danger at his current one. The terms of the deal didn't require him to reveal all the details. It was sufficient for him to admit to the killings. As a result, Torres remains behind bars, awaiting the execution that has yet to occur. As for the police officers who coerced Jerry into signing a false confession, none of them faced any consequences. Jerry himself couldn't fully return to a normal life. He began using drugs and was arrested for resisting arrest, subsequently escaping from custody and receiving a two-year prison sentence. He also couldn't reunite with his family and chose to live in Texas. After his release, he gave an interview where he admitted that the coerced confession had irreparably damaged his life. When asked why he had agreed to the confession, he said, I found my daughter dead. They didn't even need to try to break me. I was already broken. Finally, it's worth adding that the local police and the county prosecutor's office did receive well-deserved criticism from national media and the public. If they hadn't fixated on a single suspect, but instead conducted a thorough investigation, they would have had a much better chance of catching the criminal much earlier. Instead, they inadvertently allowed him to kill one woman and attack three more. And these are only the cases we know of. Alright guys, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed my video, please share your thoughts on this story. And don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Your support means a lot to me. Thank you.